Yesterday marked the seventh year since John Suat's passing away. And as the Buddha said, when you think of someone who's passed away, you have to remind yourself that you too will pass away. There's a funeral waiting for each of us here, if we're lucky, not destroyed in some event that makes it impossible for us to have a funeral. We're all going to go one way or another. There's that passage where the Buddha says, it's not only when you see someone who's passed away that you think about death. You should remind yourself every morning at sunrise, this could be your last sunrise. Every evening at sunset, this could be your last sunset. Are you ready to go? And for most of us, the answer is not yet. And we try to put the issue out of our minds, which is the least effective way of dealing with it. Because death is not going to go away if we don't think about it. We'll simply be less prepared. You have to think about it, of course, in the right way. There's ways of thinking about death to get you depressed, discouraged. You don't want to accomplish anything in life at all because it all seems so meaningless and pointless. That's not the right use of contemplation of death. The proper use is to get you to the deathless, to the point where the mind doesn't have to experience death anymore. The next best thing is to be able to approach death in such a way that the mind is not affected by the death of the body. If it's going to be reborn, it'll be reborn in a good place. And this is something we can work on as we practice, not only as we meditate, but as we go through life. Because the way we live will have a huge impact on how we die. I've noticed people who've had incidents in their lives that they really regret. As death approaches, those incidents just come up and face them. It's hard for them to escape, and so they try to forget them, and as a result, their mindfulness suffers. Because you put a lot of energy into forgetting things, you find it harder and harder to be mindful. So it's not just how we meditate, it's how we live determines how, how we're going to die. And there are three big mental qualities you want to learn how to avoid. Worry, attachment, and uncertainty. Worry here comes in many forms. One is you're worried about the people you're leaving behind. And you're worried about yourself. You think about things you've done in the past that could lead to an unfortunate rebirth. So in terms of being worried about other people, you have to realize there are times when you just can't help people anymore. You have to learn how to put those responsibilities down. This is one of the things we do as we meditate. It's each time you sit down to close your eyes, you tell yourself you've died to the world. Whatever thoughts of responsibilities come up during your meditation, you put them aside. Because the mind needs practice in this way. Otherwise, at the moment of death, your mind will go fastening on this person or that possession or on things you've done, things you've done to harm other people. This is why being really scrupulous with your precepts is important, because you don't want to have any lapses in your precepts to come up and make you worry at the time of death. 
And it's amazing how these things can come to the surface. You may be very good while you're alive at keeping them away from your awareness, putting them off, saying it doesn't really matter. But when the mind is weakened as it approaches death, these things seem to have a life of their own. So you want to examine all of your activities, make sure that they are scrupulous, that you don't want to cause the least little bit of harm or injustice. At least a little bit of dishonesty in your dealings, because these things have a way of coming back at you. So try to live in such a way that at the moment of death you won't be worried about anything, either the results of past actions or worried about unfinished business with other people. If there are people you want to apologize to, apologize to them now. To the people you want to make amends for things that you've done in the past, make amends now if you can. If you can't reach that person any longer, spread thoughts of goodwill in that person's direction. Do that many, many times so it becomes your automatic reaction to thoughts about that person. So when the time comes to go, you can make a clean break. same principle applies to your attachments. You want to make a clean break here as well. The two main things we're attached to are sensual pleasures and our bodies. If your mind tends to dwell on the pleasures you've had being a human being, the things you've seen and heard and smelled and tasted and touched, and if you've experienced no pleasures higher than that, it's going to be really scary. to contemplate the idea of letting them go. And of course, the reality as your body gets more and more and more now, it gets closer and closer to death. At the very least, you want to find some level of happiness that's higher than that, so you can begin to pry loose your attachments to these things. As the Buddha once said, even though you may realize the drawbacks of sensual attachments, you're not going to really be able to let go of them until you've had at least an experience of the pleasure that comes with strong concentration, or something higher than that. So training the mind to let go of its sensual desires and all the other hindrances that go along with them, it's an important it's an important skill to develop as you prepare yourself for the fact of death. Similarly with your attachment to your own body, as long as you identify the body as yours or as you. Death is going to be really scary, because everybody knows what happens to the body at death. It gets into a state where you can't hang on to it any longer. If you can't let go of it, you don't realize there's more to you than just the body. You're going to be like that spirit that John Fuang's students saw one night in Bangkok, perched next to its body in its coffin, not knowing where to go. So this is why the skill of meditation, where you can see the body as an object separate from your awareness of the body. There is an awareness which doesn't have to depend on the body. It's fashionable now to try to interpret the Buddhist teachings in terms of neuroscience and that okay, your awareness is totally dependent on your body and totally dependent on your sense organs and your mind and your brain. But the Buddha never taught that at all. When you can't hold on to your body, where are you going to hold on to? You're going to hold on to craving, as he said. Craving is your sustenance as you go from one life to the next. That's what keeps your sense of you as a being going in between one birth and the next. And if there's a strong craving to have a body, that's 
That's where it's going to lead you, and you may end up finding yourself latching onto just any old body at all. So this is one of the reasons we contemplate the body. Some people complain that it's a contemplation just for men who tend to be fascinated with the physical part of lust, i.e. the object of lust. But the Buddha never said that contemplation of the body was just to overcome lust. It's, all, it's to overcome your very strong attachment to your body, to see that it's nothing really worth holding on to. And you should contemplate it, you realize there is an awareness separate from that. And John Fung would have his students, if they got visions of themselves in their meditation, would have them think of the vision or the body in the vision, their own body in the vision, aging ten years or a year at a time, and then finally dying, and then thinking about how it would decompose afterwards. And then he'd have them burn it up so it was nothing but ashes, and what would be left? Well, there'd be your awareness. To drive home the point that your awareness is something separate from the body. That's another way to prepare yourself. Try to pry loose your attachment to the body, just as you try to pry yourself loose from your attachments to sensual pleasures. And there's finally the issue of uncertainty. What's going to happen to you after death? The only way really to overcome that uncertainty is to have a vision of the Dharma. I mean, practice to the point where, real, where you really see there is a deathless. The Buddha was right. He wasn't just talking about abstract ideas, but there was a direct experience, and you can experience it too. Once you've had that experience, you realize that none of the five aggregates is present in that awareness of the deathless. This is why you would cut off your they call self-identity views, the views that would, would define yourself with reference to those five aggregates in any way, either as the aggregates or as owning the aggregates or as being in the aggregates or having the aggregates in you. All those forms of self-identity just get cast aside. You see for sure that what the Buddha taught was true, that the path to the deathless is something that you develop through your actions, but then it transcends those actions. That's the point where you can overcome uncertainty. So those are the three big hindrances you've got to work with. Your attachment to sensual pleasures and to your, to your body. The worry and uncertainty. Once you've attacked those three hindrances and practiced to the point where you can get yourself beyond them, that's when the Buddha says, are you ready to go? You can say, yes. And you're not just putting up a good front. You are ready to make a clean break. So keep these issues in mind every day as you see the sun rise, as you see the sun set. These are your primary tasks for the day. <laughs>